I'm afraid this is going to be a slightly different presentation. Um, and uh, the, the reason is that I'll, 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 when preparing the presentation, I was trying to address um, a couple of questions that uh, I've been facing in Europe in the last year. One of them is that uh, decadal prediction doesn't have skill, and uh, that's something that uh, uh, Dirk already mentioned. And the, uh, the other one is that decadal prediction is not mature. Um, and uh, my uh, conclusion at the end of the, of the talk is that uh, both are irrelevant questions, basically, uh, when we look at them from a slightly different perspective. Um, let me start with uh, something that uh, actually uh, is, it has very little to do with what, we are, with what we've been talking here in the last, the last two days. Um, when people hear about 2014 being the, uh, the warmest year on record on any uh, observ observed uh, database, uh, they, they don't really know what we are talking about. It's, uh, the, the layman is, is really struggling with that kind of concept. The, the idea of global mean temperature doesn't have doesn't mean anything to, to, the, uh, to, the, person, to the people outside. Uh, this is slightly more meaningful to them, but, uh, but still it's very, very confusing. How can we talk about climate change when there are so many uh, blue areas here, blue meaning that uh, extreme uh, annual mean temperatures were recorded in 2014 in, uh, uh, in some part of the world. Uh, I, I use DRA interim, but you can get very similar results with other databases. And the, uh, the, main, the main message is that uh, people n need to understand a bit better what we are, what we are doing. They have, they have real problems to really know what, what we are doing and why we do it. Why is it relevant? And I, I know this well because I have to, I have to confront lots of people in, in, in Spain in particular that are not familiar with uh, climate modeling and climate research. So this educational component is really tough for us. So we, we do these kind of things, and we try to explain what's going on uh, in the world uh, in every year, and, uh, and, and try to explain it to, to the journalists. And uh, well, if you look here, uh, uh, Barcelona is right there, and it's very warm. It was quite, quite a nice year, 2014. This is a time series from 1940 all the way to 2014 for Barcelona airport. People don't live in Barcelona airport. They live in the city, and they really suffer from high temperatures. We never look at the temperatures really in the street where people live. But this is a separate story. So somehow, at some point, we'll have to provide this kind of information on their mobiles. And uh, there is no way around this. But let's talk about the airport. That there is something that we know how to, how to look at. And uh, well, this is actually what happened in 2014. When we say that in Barcelona, 2014 was a very warm year, uh, what we mean is uh, not just that the, uh, the, the, there were a few heat waves. Actually, if we look at the difference between the gray line here, which is a climatology for the last 70 years, and the blue line, which is what it was recorded, there were no heat waves. It was a really nice here. It, it was, I didn't use a coat much, and it, it's, it's really pleasant to live in that place. Uh, the problem is that 95% of the days are above the climatology. And this, is, this, this starts being a bit worrying, and uh, that's not that normal. So we don't have uh, days with three or four uh, Kelvin above, above the climatology, or not many, but we have plenty of days that are above the, the climatology. So someone who's old enough might, have, might be experiencing in a, in a year warm days all, day, all, all year round. So how do we explain this kind of thing? It's not obvious. We need experts to deal with this. Uh, and also, how do we convey information of this kind for the future, uh, for the next 10 years in particular, is not obvious either, because we don't even know how to do this with, uh, with our systems. So this is one of the problems that we are facing. Another problem is customers. So uh, many of you might have heard that the kettle prediction doesn't have any use. And it might be true, I'm, I'm not saying that we should uh, go, ar go around and sell decadal predictions because we, we know what they're worth. But, but people are coming up with questions like this. So there is, there's a very nice winery in, in, uh, in Catalonia. And uh, they produce very, very nice wine. They are not concerned about producing more. They want to produce exactly the same wine or as close as possible in the next 30 years. 
So for them, that's the priority. Is quality is not quantity. And that's really difficult to do, very, very complicated. So as you saw, temperatures are going up. We are having more uh, warmer years. And, uh, and what, what they thought is, well, let's go up to the mountains. But the mountains, they, well, you, they, there's only a certain amount that you can go up and, and plant your, your vines because you run out of mountains very quickly. So you have to do something. What they've done is they, 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 they are going to Chile. But they come up with a question like this. What's going to be the, uh, the weather history and the climate history in Chile in a very nice area that they are looking for? They, they are going to spend a few million euros to buy land there in the next 30 to 40 years. They're not, they don't care about 2100. They want to know what's going to happen from next year all the way to 30 years into, into the future. And, uh, and they need to make a decision now. So they, they really don't know anything about the Kedo prediction. Maybe they don't even need to know this. But what is clear for them is that they know that there is a, a concept that is being developed with, uh, that is climate services. And climate services are using climate prediction as just one tool. Climate prediction is, and the Kedo prediction in, part, in particular, is only one tool out of the many tools that we have out there to provide climate information. So that's where climate prediction sits in the real world. And that's something that I think, I believe, that we have to take into account when we design CIMIP. And when we, in particular, uh, think about uh, a dedicated prediction of uh, inside CIMIP, CIMIP 6. So when did you actually reply to them? We're working for them. So now we are. We are trying to put all the decadal predictions together, all the climate projections, all the cortex data, all the observations, make a, a full report and then discuss it with them. So we are trying to be honest. We, we tell them we know very little. So that's, that's what, but they're still interested. And you're still charging them. Oh, we are, yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course we are. <laughs> in, in wine. <laughs> so, um, Climate services is, is a, it's a past word or a past concept that is, that is going around and, and it's actually quite, quite diffuse and it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult to grasp really what is behind. But climate services is just, a, just a, another research component of, of climate. And uh, uh, there is a very nice project, it's called Euporius. It's a project also funded by the European Union that came up with a few principles that climate scientists should uh, bear in mind when interacting with other elements in, uh, uh, in, the, in the climate services field. So uh, you have to define your problem. You have to use solid pillars for the knowledge and the data. You need to listen. You need to be transparent, all the process. You need to be flexible. You need to have a roadmap to know where you go, where you're going, and, uh, and, and why. And you need to evaluate the process at all stages. So I'm not talking of correlation here. Correlation doesn't mean anything. It's really going beyond correlation. It's really trying to assess what is the uh, actual value of the, uh, of the information that you have. And value is, again, a very, a very uh, 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 well, diffuse concept. And what, what is behind this principle is that climate data is not climate information. So, when we show a correlation, when we show uh, uh, an ensemble of, of solutions from our models, this is not climate information. To get to climate information, we have a long way to go. And that's something that in uh, decadal prediction, we, we, we can't avoid. It's, there is no way around. We have to do this thing because, because people don't know what decadal prediction is. So the, the project I'm going to talk about is SPECS. You, you might have heard about it, and um, well, some of the European colleagues here might uh, and have been showing already some of their uh, uh, actions in the, in the project. Uh, it's quite a complex project with uh, quite a lot of people involved and, uh, uh, well, addressing issues like uh, evaluate, evaluating the processes uh, that are responsible for, uh, for predictability, both at seasonal and decadal timescales. So, uh, SPECS is working not just at decadal timescales, it's bringing together the two timescales, addressing issues like focus quality, like what uh, Wolfgang has been talking about, improving the, uh, uh, the initialization of the systems, and also exploring which other processes are not in the, in the systems right now 
that we can easily grab from the knowledge that is available from other areas in climate research. Uh, we need to provide information where it's really valuable, which is most of the time over land. And uh, uh, there is a strong component in, uh, in specs which concerns disseminating the data uh, and uh, explaining what we are doing to the, to the public. And uh, linking to Euporius, this other climate services project that is, is uh, really working very closely together with, uh, with specs. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to address only four of the issues that appear here. Uh, and uh, if you want more details about the activities that other people are doing, please uh, ask me and I'll direct you to the right people. Um, so where do we start from? Um, just a, an illustrative example. Uh, and uh, this is taken from the CIMIT-5 decadal predictions. This is the uh, AMO scale as a function of the forecast time. So for, uh, this is correlation for the years uh, 1 to 4, 2 to 5, 3 to 6, and so on. At the top, we have the results from the multi-model uh, for uh, the uh, start dates initialized every five years. And at the bottom, for the start dates initialized every year. Uh, they are not exactly the same systems, but it doesn't matter. The, uh, the message is that uh, if we compare what we get for the AMO when we start the uh, forecasts every five years, it's very difficult to say that the initialized runs are better than the non-initialized ones, basically because there is a lot of noise and we've heard a lot about ensemble size, but also the frequency of the start dates matters. So we have another dimension to bear in mind, to take into account here. There is a, there is a very nice piece of work by Phil Sampson, someone from uh, the, uh, the uh, University of Exeter, that unfortunately is still not uh, submitted, uh, but uh, that I strongly recommend you to have a look if you really want to know what is the trade-off between ensemble size, uh, Hanker's length, and, uh, and uh, start date frequency. So basically, the, uh, the message is that if we look at systems that have been frequently uh, initialized, we know that uh, the, a the AMO can be, uh, can be predicted uh, better uh, than, uh, than uh, what we can do with the, uh, with the historical simulations. However, that's in terms of the ensemble mean, and uh, uh, those that are familiar with uh, seasonal forecasting might have heard about probabilistic forecasting. So let's forget the ensemble mean. Let's try to come up with uh, probabilities that address specific events. So the probability of the AMO being above normal or above uh, being in the, on the extreme quartile. And this is uh, something that we see here is uh, a reliability diagram. And uh, on the left, you have the reliability diagram for the uh, initialized simulations for the uh, forecast, uh, forecast average two to nine years, and on the right for the historical runs. And uh, uh, these are relevant uh, figures because what we see in that reliability diagram is the ability of the system to issue probabilities that are trustworthy. Trustworthy meaning that a user can put the money on the system uh, and, uh, and uh, still not, not lose it in the, in the long term, of course. Yeah. So what we see is uh, something that, is, uh, uh, that we are looking for all, all the time when we do a reliability diagram, that the uh, initialized runs have a reliability diagram that is spreaded and it's closer to the uh, diagonal. So we want to be in the diagonal because this point here means that when I issue a probability and a focus with a probability of 0.9, the probability of being the, the AMO being above uh, the, the, the median or above normal of, uh, uh, with a probability of 0.9, it actually verifies almost all the time. And this is not obvious. This is not obvious and it's something that you don't get when you use historical simulations. This links to what Matt was, was saying yesterday about the, uh, the historical simulations not being able to capture the, uh, the hiatus. It's, we, are, we are talking of essentially the same thing. This is, however, very relevant, not for us, probably, but for the users. Because while for a user, an ensemble mean doesn't mean anything because they can't use it, the uh, probability focus they are, and they need to be reliable. And that's what we are looking at here. However, people don't live uh, on the uh, AMO, and uh, they need to, they need variables that are meaningful for their purposes. And uh, one of these variables uh, is the accumulated cyclone energy. So it's a measure of the, uh, 
of the uh, 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 tropical cyclone activity in the North Atlantic. Again, for two to nine focus year averages. And uh, again, for the multimodal, uh, the left for the initialized runs, on the right for the uh, non-initialized ones. And uh, although these plots might not look spectacular to you, they make the full difference when interacting with the users. So somehow, and this is, this is a, a paper that was recently published in GRL, somehow this uh, attracted the attention of RMS, which is a, a, a risk management uh, company, and suddenly they, they found out that there is something here that they can use. They don't really care about how we initialize the forecast. They, they just know that there is information here that they don't have otherwise. They can't take it from the traditional SIMIP integrations. And that's why it's useful to have a dedicated prediction in, in SIMIP. So how can we make all these forecasts a bit, a bit better? How can we improve the uh, little things that we know are already skillful? And uh, one of the uh, issues that has been mentioned uh, in the last, uh, in, the few, in, in a few talks already, is the role of density. What we see here, and this is motivated by one of the uh, approaches that has been followed to, uh, to address uh, the problem of the initial shock in which uh, there are two approaches. One is a full field initialization where the, the uh, high costs or the full costs are initialized from realistic initial conditions, while the, uh, the alternative, the anomaly initialization approach, uh, the uh, full costs are initialized by inserting the observed anomalies somehow into the model world and running from there, expecting that the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, model drift would, would disappear. Uh, the devil is, is most of the time in the detail. And uh, the anomaly initialization until now has been most of the time applied by uh, correcting TNS. I think, Wolfgang, you mentioned this thing about the, uh, the uh, prototype system. No, you correct TNS. And it's, it's basically what we are all doing. Uh, the problem is that the uh, water mass properties are not conserved by doing this thing. Because basically, what we should correct is, is the density and then reconstruct the salinity from the T and, and, and density fields. So what we see here is the uh, relative size of the error that we are making by using an approach of uh, anomaly initialization based on T and S corrections instead of T and density corrections. And well, not surprisingly, those errors are largest in the areas where the water masses are being formed. So there is there is, uh, there is impression in the community that anomaly initialization is not bringing us uh, what we were expecting in terms of getting rid of the, uh, of the initial shock and in terms of providing better forecasts. Uh, but the problem might be that we are not implementing it in the right way, and that this is a suggestion of it. And the problem that we are facing is that whenever we introduce uh, a modification in the way we initialize our system. And this is something that many other colleagues have, have uh, confronted both in Europe and uh, in the US. When we try to implement a, a more sophisticated way of producing anomaly initialization initial conditions, uh, it's very difficult to distinguish, to discriminate which system is the best one. So this is what we see here in which we see a pack of uh, AMO skill scores from uh, different uh, decadal prediction simulations performed with EC Earth 2.3, in which we can't really distinguish between which one is better in terms of anomaly initialization, in terms of full field initialization, in terms of the uh, different approaches to anomaly initialization. So what in the project we, we have been trying to do is to go back to uh, uh, lower grounds and uh, to use simplified models. So somehow we, we, we use the battery of simplified models starting from the Lorenz model going all the way to a simplified couple model that uh, has an atmosphere and, and the ocean. And we found out that the, uh, the, the time, the, the conditions un, under which the anomaly initialization approach is better or could be better than the uh, full field initialization approach depends actually of the characteristics of the model compared to that uh, of the observations. So we found out 
that there are different types of errors, that there are errors that consist in a very strong initial shock and then a stable climate in which uh, the uh, anomaly initialization would work better, and other uh, types of errors or other types of models in which the model is drifting for a long time and then the full field initialization might work better. Um, so just a few words about uh, volcanic forcing. That's uh, another, uh, uh, another activity that is taking place in the, uh, in the project. And uh, I, I would just like to say that uh, trying to contribute to the, the uh, volcanic uh, uh, aspects of component C, uh, we are trying, uh, not just one partner, but several partners in the project, we are trying to assess what is the, uh, what is the error that we are, we are making by assuming that we are specifying perfectly the uh, volcanic aerosol in the uh, forecast, and also what is the interaction between the, the initialization and the, uh, and the uh, uh, volcanic aerosol forcing. Um, just um, to conclude, uh, three different aspects that we include in the project and that are very re relevant for uh, the uh, uh, decadal prediction component of CIMIP6. It was already mentioned that we don't have common tools for verification, so we can't really compare what each one of us is doing. Uh, in specs, several of us are working together to release a set of functions that we can all download and that we can, that can interact easily with ESGF so that we all use the same functions and the same observational data sets so that we can compare with scores. The other is communication. And this is something that links to some of the uh, actions that uh, uh, we are promoting through the WGSIP which is really producing information out that, that, uh, can, that the public can really read and uh, try to get a grasp of what we are talking about. And the final one has to do with data dissemination. So something that uh, somehow we also have to discuss this week is how we are going to contribute to Seymour 3. Seymour 3 is being produced, and there are some very important aspects that we have to take into account concerning the Gable prediction, in particular, having a double time axis, which is not immediate. And uh, without this, we are going to be in trouble with ESGF. We are working to get it included in CIMR3, but it would be nice to have more people involved in this. And uh, just as a summary, uh, there is a broadening range of uses which are looking at us from the climate services perspective, not from CIMIP. I'm not saying that these are all the users, but uh, there are quite a lot of them. And uh, they need information for the next 30 years. And they need that information condensed into a single source, in, into a single stream of information. They don't want to know about Cordex, CIMIP, the cattle prediction operational. That's not what they are looking for. They're looking for an integrated story. We need different tools to uh, provide, a, a, to, we need to integrate those different tools and provide that single story and merge this information. And that's a problem that hasn't been tackled yet, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. There are some successful stories of the use of decadal prediction, and, uh, and, and they are growing. Uh, in spite of the, the skill being limited with respect to what we get from, uh, from the uh, historical runs, but there's no way around. So we need to improve the observational network, and uh, above all, we need to improve the model. So we have to be really in touch with the rest of CIMIP. Uh, the cadre prediction can't really live uh, alive on its own. And that's it. Thank you. Yes. Um, yes, Paco. I think it's really good that you brought up this uh, user perspective here and the needs of users for uh, better information. So I think it's a really important point that is very often forgotten in our discussions here, uh, and especially. I'm wondering how you're addressing this question of the, uh, like the example that you brought up, the, the Taurus winery, that is looking for climate information on a 30-year time scale. I mean, we know that, or we are planning our decay prediction experiments for five years, or maybe running up to 10 years, and we already know that there is no skill after five years, but they're asking for 30 years. How are we going to do that? Well, there is no skill coming from the initialization after five years but there is skill after five years. So 
this is, this is the first thing that we have to be careful with when talking to the users. And the second thing is that uh, when talking to the users, we don't define the skill. So we don't, we don't decide if the kettle prediction is mature or not. They decide. Because if, if we don't help them and uh, we make the decision for them, they'll go and get the data anyway because the data are free and they're going to use it. So the, uh, the, the problem that you're mentioning is exactly the same problem that uh, people like Arun are facing for uh, the subseasonal and seasonal time scales. So with the subseasonal time scale pre uh, predictions up to 45 days into the future, you, you, you can only predict uh, what will happen in the next 45 days. But people want to know what the, uh, what the NAO is going to be two or three months later. So the difficulty is how to bring together those subseasonal forecasts with the seasonal forecasts to provide a, a, a robust story that is useful for the user. So how, how do we bring these 10 year initialized simulations with uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the projections is, is going to be our challenge. And, uh, and we, don't have a, we don't have a response for this, but we need, we need, to, we need to really look into it. It's, we, we have the people really knocking at our door asking for, for these things. You went through this pretty quickly. I, I didn't quite understand what you were doing with volcanic eruptions. Maybe you can say a couple more words about exactly what you're doing. Yeah, I think this is part of, of a coordinated discussion that is involving Cerifax and uh, also uh, uh, the, uh, the MPI. Um, and uh, what we are what we are doing is basically uh, looking at what our predictions for this is for Pinatubo, but we do it for the different eruptions, and this is for a single model. So this is uh, global mean temperature, but we also look at the uh, response on sea level pressure and all these things. So we we try to understand what is the difference between the uh, handcasts when we initialize them. We don't prescribe any volcanic aerosols, so just the background. What we get with exactly the same system in which we have initialization and a perfect prescription of the volcanic aerosol. So there is no, there is no chemistry in there. No ozone, uh, interactive ozone, nothing. And, 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 and no QBO? Oh, yes, there is a QBO. But the, uh, of course, it will be destroyed. Yeah. Yes, yes, it is. So the, the full atmosphere is, is initialized in 3D. So the, uh, the third one is considering that we don't initialize and then we, we prescribe the volcanoes, like in a historical simulation. And then there are other sensitivity experiments that are coming up. So uh, for instance, how do we go from here to here? So can we, idealize, can we use an idealized uh, uh, volcanic aerosol uh, uh, loads no, in the atmosphere? How do you address and specify the volcanic? Well, it depends on the models. That's a, that's a problem. So each model is using a, a different one. So that, that's why this is done in a coordinated way, because we, we, we wouldn't be able to extract conclusions from a single model. That, that would be meaningful. The problem is that, oh, sorry, yeah. No, Claudia will explain later that yeah. Vomit is, is sort of looking at some of the same issues. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is, yeah. This is done in, in try to coordinate a, a bit more what Volmip is planning with what Component C is, is, is planning to do. But I, I guess Leon is, is going to talk about this later. Klaus comment. I mean, um, <laughs> but I, I do just want to leave it as it is. I think we, we, we do have increasingly knowledge of additional skill from initialization, so tropical storms, and I think we are working on summer climate. So I um, just want to mention that. So it, it's not nothing that we have. So. <laughs> no, no, I, I didn't say we don't have skill, but I just say I mean, we, we know that it increased rapidly, and I. I don't see, or I, I don't expect skills from initialized forecast to extend up to 30 years. I mean, that, that hasn't been shown that that exists. Okay, okay. Are there, you had an interesting topic there, actually. Uh, in anomaly initialization, instead of initializing TNS, you initialize temperature and density, which is also, also used in isothermal ocean models. You have a choice. But in your case, when you construct the anomaly densities, aren't you using the anomaly salinity to begin with? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. How do you construct your anomalous density, I guess? 
in the you mean in the second it requires temperature anomaly which is available but the density anomaly is not so you have to use salinity anomaly to construct the density anomaly sure. then you impose it then you backtrack and we create the salinity that's that's precisely what we do so we use the same function that is in nemo to to construct the density offline Yep. To choose something. And then we need an iterative process to reconstruct the salinity from these T and rho new fields that we, we are constructing from uh, changing the, 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 the climatology for those fields. I guess conceptually I don't follow it quite because mm. the, the density anomalies that you are using, is also, they are also using the TNS anomalies to begin with. And if your model is doing the right thing, it should create the proper density anomaly. But it's not doing the, 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 uh, the right thing. That's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, independent of the model. Yeah. yeah but you have to, to make your density, you have to use full field temperature. Yeah. Full field. You, you can't use the anomaly it's itself. Okay. I got it. the, okay. So basically, you need, the, you need T and rho yeah. from the model, from the uh, reanalysis. Okay. No, I, then, I understand about yeah. the we used before. Yeah, yeah. So just a non-linearity of the equation of state. Equation yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah, definitely. But it's, it's very simple, but it's a problem yeah. that is hurting us. Okay, thank you very much, Paco. Thanks all our speakers. Let's have some